Welcome to episode 50 of the Yoga Meets Movement Science podcast. Today, we are diving into the fascinating topic of yoga and artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence, or AI, is all the rage right now, with chatbots like ChatGPT making headlines over the past year for their uncanny abilities to generate human-like text and perform shockingly well on standardized tests like the LSAT for law school and the GRE for grad school. In today's episode, we're going to focus on a different application of AI, which is using it to learn yoga through video motion analysis. We will discuss what AI can do, what it can't do, what concerns we have, and what our hopes are for this technology. And specifically, we'll focus on what this all means for teaching yoga and other forms of movement, especially as those topics relate to things like alignment and pain and cueing. To explore this juicy topic, we are thrilled to welcome Jules Mitchell, Jenny's primary yoga mentor, to this podcast. Jules is a renowned yoga teacher, educator, massage therapist, and author who brings a unique blend of science and holistic understanding to the world of yoga. Her yoga journey, which spans almost three decades, led her to specialize in biomechanics through a graduate program in exercise science. Jules is the author of Yoga Biomechanics, Stretching Redefined, and has played a pivotal role in educating other yoga teachers about biomechanics, pain science, and yoga research. In addition to being passionate about yoga and science, a couple of fun facts about Jules are that she is a lover of electronic dance music and cats. So she fits right in with us as animal lovers on this podcast. Jules's expertise in biomechanics is particularly relevant to today's topic, which is again, learning yoga through AI video motion analysis. And recently, Jules collaborated with a company that was developing this technology. And uh, although, as we understand it, the company's progress has stalled in recent months, we know that Jules has valuable insights to share from that process. So Jules, welcome to the Yoga Meets Movement Science podcast. Thanks for having me. That was a beautiful introduction. <laughs> yes, uh, great. Well-deserved. <laughs> yes, Jules, we are so excited to have you here with us today. Thank you so much for taking the time and being with us on the podcast. And we're very excited to talk to you about this topic of yoga and AI. I know I personally have not really seen this topic like delved into kind of out there, at least not that's come across my radar. So I really appreciate the opportunity to talk and learn from you about this. And our audience is also just super lucky because you're like the perfect person to talk to about this because, you know, yoga teacher, but also your biomechanics knowledge and your own personal connection with, um, with AI technologies. And I know you've also read research on AI that I know you're going to share about with us today. So we're super excited to learn about this. And I know it's a big topic and there's a lot to discuss, but could we maybe start off by just asking you, like me, I'm sure maybe some people in our audience uh, don't have much familiarity with even kind of like the like what AI is and and what it looks like in kind of our modern world. So perhaps could you just give us an intro to like what AI is and why you personally find the topic interesting? Because I kind of assume that you do. But yes. Yeah, um, okay, so AI is like basically machine learning. And the, the way it's being researched and developed in the context of teaching yoga at the moment is to help students know if they're doing the pose correctly. And I'm using air quotes for those that are just listening. And so right away, that's where my attention, you know, gets escalated um, because I feel like literally my life's work has been to um, unravel these ideas of correctness, you know, uh, through biomechanics. And so that's the main premise. Now, it's very nuanced. There's a lot of detail that we'll dive into, but that's the basics of it is machine learning is teaching someone how to do yoga. Um, I personally, just as a disclaimer so that everybody understands, I'm not a computer engineer. <laughs> I, I don't know the back end of how this stuff works. Some of the research is very, very technical in how they write the algorithms and 
Um, yes, I like math, but I'm not, I'm not at that level. It's a different uh, level. It is a different level, exactly. Um, so I can appreciate it, but I don't really know that end of it. So those listeners, don't worry, it's not going to get super technical. Uh, it's really <laughs> more about me working with some of those people because they are interested in yoga and they like yoga, but they don't have any context of what teaching yoga is like. You know, they might they might take a couple classes here and there and think, oh, this is a cool thing. And so when I work as a consultant with them, it's me sharing with them the yoga side of things. And as you can imagine, right. we don't always align. <laughs> so I ask them really you know, interesting questions. Uh, and again, we'll get into those. Um, and th most recently, the the uh, group that I was working with, they were like, yeah, I don't think this is possible. <laughs> so they put it on pause. But yeah, we'll get there at the end of the story. So uh, Travis had just introduced that it like they put it on pause. I don't think they put it on pause. I think they put it on end and, and pivoted yeah. elsewhere. I, I tried to word it nicely. I guess yeah. I, I maybe this is getting to the end at the beginning, but like, <laughs> are you, when you went into it, I'm sure you had your reservations. Like, mm -hmm. uh, I'm not sure that this is going to work. And it sounded like they were pretty, um, pretty optimistic, but then things changed. And I'm sure it's as a result of those sorts of conversations that you just described. Yeah, pretty much. And I knew that because just as a little kind of background, um, the first time I actually consulted with a developing team for AI was in 2017. And mm. I didn't go, I didn't go look it up intentionally to prepare for this call because I had to sign an NDA. So I, I it's better that I don't remember a lot of the details. Um, but I think, think this is, you know, we're, we're recording at the end of 2023 right now. So, so think about that five years ago, I mean, it, AI is now all the rage. I mean, literally mm -hmm. every tool that I use to run my online business has its own AI option now. AI course builders, yes. AI email builders, AI quiz writers. Like it's unbelievable how how it's taken over just in the last year or two. Mm -hmm. And I think everybody's racing to be the first one to, you know, to to be the leader in the space. And so that's kind of what's happening. And even as a side note, um, since we're not short on time. My sister works in, used to work in tech in San Francisco right. and the AI surge made her quit. She left, she left the industry. She's like, I can't deal with this <laughs> because oh it's gosh. so competitive right now because everybody's trying to be the leader, you know? I'm so on, I think, uh, go ahead. I, I subscribe to a newsletter that basically just every day, like Monday through Friday, gives a, it's called the rundown. It gives a rundown of basically what you're describing. Like, oh, this company today came out with this new thing, which is going to be the top competitor to this. And it's all yeah. of the, all of the companies that you can possibly think of are trying to do their version yeah. of generative AI or yeah. an AI assistant. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's really overwhelming. And so as a result, of course, there's this huge surge now of yoga AI papers coming out in different tons of different, you know, uh, devices and tons of different programs that are trying to improve. So the 2017 gr group, you know, this was like the first of its kind, which is why there was an NDA. I don't think today's there's NDAs because it's all it's all available information now. Um, but anyway, this this is a similar thing that happened back then. They brought me on and I started asking them questions like, well, what do you do if the knee if the students knee hurts? How does the AI respond to that? Right. How does the student right. tell the AI, you know, like those types of things? And and at that time, they they didn't even like it was so far removed from the, their conception, <laughs> you know, that they didn't even know how to answer it. And I think we were they were applying for a grant is what I recall. And so I was like, you know, who's going to be reviewing this, these applications? If you get a physiotherapist in here, they're going to be asking you these questions, you know, like, you know, how, how do you, how are you expecting this to help someone, you know, rehab this or whatever? And so they just were, they just couldn't even answer my questions. Um, so that's in the past. We won't talk much about them. It's a lot more sophisticated now and we can interact a lot better. And, and 
back then I never even saw the technology. I think it was more like a proposal versus the more recent one. Um, I would like, I gave them one of my classes and they uploaded it and I got to take my own class with the AI. So we can talk about all of that, Whoa. but this, so I got to see the model. Yeah. It was really cool. That's very, yeah, that's very cool. Mm -hmm. um, could you, Jules, maybe explain just for those of us who might be wondering, like, I guess maybe with the example of this recent company that you, it sounds like you were working with, um, what, what does it actually look like concretely, like in an applied mm -hmm. manner for AI, like for AI to actually teach someone yoga? Is it mm -hmm. video motion analysis and, and like, what is that? Or like, what does it look like? Yeah. Okay. So there's, <laughs> there's a lot of different ways. And, you know, again, if you, if you just do a quick literature search, you can find papers that will break all that stuff down. I mean, remember the wearable yoga pants, like that was a thing yes. for a while, but it had too many problems and was always breaking. Nobody does that anymore. So the, the most recent iteration looks generally like this. Um, a computer takes a, a, a standardized model. So that in this situation, it would be like, I gave them one of my classes and they uploaded my class that I was teaching to online students, you know, just like a recording of me on my mat teaching a yoga class. And it, the computer used that as the standard. And then I could, you know, I took it myself, but you could take it, you know, so then I would set my own computer up on a yoga mat in the sagittal plane. You know, that's mm -hmm. also one of the limitations. We don't have 3D stuff. So we're just looking at it. So the long edge of my mat, you know, and, and then I would use my camera and the AI, the machine um, would compare the person on the mat to me teaching to the class that I gave and would give corrections, like overriding my own, like overriding the instructor's cues. Uh, if it was in deemed it incorrect. So that's the general look of it. Makes and it's uh, verbal. I mean, it's a computer talking, but. Yes, it's a computer talking. It's verbal. And there are, um, again, because there's so much variation and all these different companies are racing. So I read in the research that they're like, cause sometimes you get a paper that compares different, you know, computer models. Um, but there was like some, I think we'll take a screenshot and put it at the top of you. Like there's different iterations of it, but in general, it's a verbal, it's verbal feedback. Yes. So this sounds amazing, right? Um, <laughs> in, in theory, at least, and then we can talk about practice, but like the idea that you could not need to go to a yoga teacher um, because this AI can be your, your yoga teacher and it's comparing you to this prototypical shape and giving you feedback if you're not embodying the shape the way that it thinks you should. So so like if that, and we'll talk about what the challenges of that are, you mentioned the sagittal plane, and then just, well, what, like, what makes you the perfect prototype? And then all mm -hmm. of that. But uh, it, like assuming that we could just agree on those things, that's awesome. Like for, especially yeah. for a beginner to be able to be like, oh, um, I didn't know that I was supposed to push back farther in down dog or um, yeah. uh, have like a wider foot placement in warrior or whatever. Yeah. So that could be really useful potentially. It, potentially it could be very <laughs> useful. And I just, I compare this to, you know, my early yoga days uh, mm -hmm. where I practiced yoga on a DVD. So that is in its, in a sense, some sort of machine learning, right? I was watching a screen and I was mimicking the yoga poses, right? So that's kind of the, the difference that they're trying to sell with this now is that it can watch you and let you know if you're doing it correct. That's the, that's the, you know, the theory behind it. What's so interesting is when you read and you ask, because I've consulted with these guys, you know, and, and you get into it, the, the explanation for why it's better than the DVD is often it's more personalized. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's doubtful. Okay. We can get into that as a, as a subject. Another argument is it's safer. That's also yeah. doubtful. <laughs> That's another argument we can get into. And then you said one of the other things that was like, oh, it would be really great 
for the teacher, if the teacher's overwhelmed and too busy, they could just like, so, so like they could just, you know, give them the AI version and, 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 but, you know, so again, that was that, that kind of personal touch, but somehow saving time. I don't know. That to me just seems like a, a stretch, <laughs> no pun intended. <laughs> the personalized piece is so interesting because they're approaching it from the standpoint of, yeah, this is giving you individualized feedback based on your mm -hmm. performance. Um, and it's very scalable because you can deploy this to unlimited number of people versus one teacher can only help so many students. Mm -hmm. um, but then, well, what does personalized really mean? Because the expert teacher personalizes it differently to the person than the you computer know, is personalizing it toward the instructor as the model and not personalizing to the student. So it's kind of a contradiction. You know what I mean? Like the argument is it feels more personal to the student is like, well, maybe it's not, <laughs> you know? Absolutely. So that's so interesting to think about, like personalizing, you know, from that context and like what that actually means. And are we personalizing to the individual taking the class? or are we personalizing to the yoga instructor model? So I guess just a quick question I had, Jules, and, uh, when you were describing this earlier is, when you say that um, that you uploaded a class that you taught, I'm assuming that this would be like a class you narrated where you actually demoed and moved through every single pose, like versus kind of hanging out and talking to the leading students. So it was one where you did the whole practice and you narrated it? Well, that's one of the problems is that I I just gave them a pre-existing class. So I didn't film a class for them because that was I wanted to if you want a natural teacher in their natural element, you know, I just gave them it was like a it was like a 20 minute class. It was like neck relief for beginners or something. So it was not a very complicated, you know, a complicated class, not a lot of hard poses. And so obviously I was demonstrating because it's like I'm filming into a camera so I'm not just standing there talking I'm, I'm mm -hmm. demonstrating but I'm being my natural self and so this is like one of the problems um I'm let's say I'm in a kneeling lunge and um and then I'm showing like an arm with an option with the arms let's just say arms overhead you know and then I'm describing during that pose, well, maybe if you would rather just kind of maybe interlace your hands behind your head to let your shoulders relax and be able to, you know, I'm giving a, a, a arm variation that fits into the theme of the class. Yes. How does the computer and the student is actually like, no, I prefer my arms overhead. They're doing the first variation and I'm demonstrating a modification. How does the computer know that the student is doing it correctly because they're choosing the first version and not following me and mimicking everything I'm doing. Starts, so, the sirens start ringing. It's like, you're doing it wrong. And it's like, no, she said I could do this. Exactly. But the, so yeah, that's the, the most obvious of, problem. Yeah. Oh, you could go down this path or that path. Oh my goodness. Yeah. <laughs> like you're, yeah. you're layering on, it's not just what the, how the teacher is demonstrating it, yep. but also what they're saying, and then at the, you have to simultaneously allow for both of those options. Yep, so the only way that this would work under this framework is that I taught a class specifically, only doing the pose the way I wanted everyone to do it, right. and doing every pose. And like, when I teach an online class, like I actually sometimes, like let's just say we do a whole little standing sequence, and then I give people like an option to vinyasa, I don't want to do the vinyasa. I'm talking and teaching them out of breath. So I just sit down like in hero's pose on my heels and let everyone at home, I'm not watching them because it's a recorded class. I'm, you know, you can do what you want. Stay in down dog, vinyasa. I don't care. Do some handstands or take a little rest, you know? So the computer sees me taking a break, you know, and is like, oh no, you're doing, you're moving. You should be sitting. You know, it's like, it doesn't know how to register that. So I, right. so the reality of it is so I wouldn't smart. be able to teach. Yeah. When well, I wouldn't be able to teach the way I want to. I'd have to like alter my teaching style. Right. So, so like you said, you gave them a class that was true to form the way that you teach and said, okay, mm -hmm. um, do, do with this what you can, because this is how I would do it, which is the most, uh, real world application of it. But then they come to find, oh, well, there are all these challenges with that. So can you do it this way where you're actually just going through the whole class. But that's, like you said, that's not how you teach. 
that's not necessarily the best practice for teaching because you do want to be able to give people options, but then it becomes like this crazy, complicated AI problem. Absolutely. Absolutely. And then there's more. So um, I'm trying to find a, a way to have a linear conversation so we're not bouncing back and forth because there's a lot of little things that come up within that, right? So one of the first things that came up was because I was asking, you know, the developers, I was like, so how, like, how does the computer determine when to make the correction, right? Like, that's the first question that I asked. And, mm -hmm. and so they told me it was kind of based on time. So like, there's a certain, like, if you're, if you don't get into the pose fast enough or whatever, it's like, there's a lag, right? So they wait a certain amount of time. They didn't tell me the details. I'm sure that's, you know, their proprietary information, but there was a certain amount of time. And then if you're not matching the instructor, then it would speak up, you know, and it would tell you, you know, Hey, do this. Hey, do that. Uh, so that was the first thing. And then they revealed to me in some, you know, back and forth discussion that the computer was actually better. This is so fascinating. It was better at minor discrepancies than large discrepancies. So I think like if you're in like downward dog and the teacher's sitting, the computer gets like thrown off. It's like, are you doing the pose? Are you not doing that? Like what's happening? It doesn't know what to do. It doesn't know how to like direct you into the pose, right? So, so it was much better at the minutia, like bend your knee a little bit more, which is so funny because that it goes against human variability. That goes against everything that we understand, you know? People are gonna have different lengths of stances for different reasons and, uh, you know, and the the simple like, you know, kinematic data points aren't going to resolve that. And so I thought that was really interesting, but it was like, the, it was the details. So it was like being hypercritical, I guess. <laughs> like, yeah. like, like, um, excelling at being nitpicky or something yeah. and yes. then not being helpful where maybe it would be more helpful. Yes. It's like counterintuitive. And yes. the other piece of that, like, <clears throat> that's a very difficult, uh, teacher skill, right? To know when to correct. So time-based, yeah, you, you want to give people a chance, understand that idea and that algorithmic decision. Like, okay, we want to give somebody a chance to see it and then uh, mirror it. But also like from a motor learning queuing standpoint, like, well, maybe you want to allow the person to make some mistakes as long as they're safe the first time. And then when you repeat it, that's when maybe they figure it out and they don't need the queue or whatever, like right. to be able to program that into AI, that's hard. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So what that was one of the, what was one of the issues as well? So like, let's just go back to the kneeling lunge example. So I was in, you know, Anjanayasana, back knee down, kneeling lunge. And I was, I had a whole theme to the class, which is what makes it yoga, right? So the theme was sort of like the, like, the tamasic heaviness of the lower body, right? Because it was for the neck, right? So the heaviness of the lower body and the more rajasic, like curious spine and arms and the sattvic quality of the face, like the very soft face and neck. And, you know, like, so this was the theme of the class and it was just real gentle and flowy again, like 20 minutes. So I'm in this lunge. And so my cueing for the lunge was to kind of find a depth where they could feel that, where they could feel kind of that, the legs supporting them and rooting them down and then some lightness in the upper body. And so I was like demonstrating like when way deep, pushing the knee way forward and getting a big hip flexor stretch and how that might like lunge you forward and take you out of that sensation. And if you go too far back, so I was like kind of oscillating between a range to, to help achieve a certain skill. And while I was, because I practiced against my own class. And while I was doing that, the computer came over and like cut off my like sensory instructions and was like telling me the right place to be in the lunge, you know? And I was like, I was like, you're completely like it interrupting any opportunity for learning because I'm actually providing a, a sensory experience and where the person can individualize it. And the computer's like, uh-uh, uh-uh, you're, you're not matching. It was wild. Yeah, it has to be like such a rote and simple and yeah. non-exploratory. 
like yeah if it's the if it's a fixed sequence and there's one option for everything and you're just going through the motions that could work mm-hmm. but like you said that's not how you teach um that's not necessarily people's favorite way to take a class and then <laughs> uh, there's <laughs> not just so the feedback that the computer gives you there's like two layers to it. So far we've talked about the one where it compares it against the instructor and, you know, the model. Mm -hmm. Um, And then the other thing is it, it gives like generic cueing as well. So that was really wild to me. So it's like layered in to, to like the, the poses, I guess. So the, the computer kind of understands what's happening and and it gives some instructions. So when I was doing that lunge thing, the computer instructions weren't even, com- at that moment, they weren't even comparing it to me because I was kind of moving around. And I think the computer like wires got crossed and was like, I don't know what to do. Why is she moving around? You know, this is supposed to be a static pose. And so it I, I wrote it down because I wanted to get it at completely accurate. It said, it piped in, and said, don't let your knee go in front of the ankle because it puts strain on the knee. Uh-oh. That was the exact <laughs> quote that it gave me. While I'm literally like trying helping someone find a lunge where they can feel strong in the legs. <laughs> that was the quote it gave me. I was and like, where did where do you where did they get like that generic? Because they I'm sure they didn't get that cue from you. I can no. really imagine. <laughs> so so again, like this is kind of where I like dug into the research. They obviously got some list of cues from another yoga teacher or something, you know, like and a lot of this stuff is online and it's you know available. Um, but so when I was, you know, I'm always reading these papers when they come out because I was curious what's happening. And and a lot of them have like a, a set of instructions that get inputted. So they learn about the pose. And they're like, triangle pose is 90 degrees rotation on the front leg, 15 degrees rotated on the back leg. And they put that into the the, the verbal cueing as well. So it's like we're going backwards in time. (laughs) Do you know that it's like it's the 1990s and we're teaching alignment-based yoga? Do you know? It's wild. That's such a hard problem because like you, I can't think of another way to do it. (laughs) <laughs> um, mm-hmm. but that's not where we're at in 2023. It's not where we're at. No. You want to hear some more? I have some more over there. Yes, please. Okay. Joel. <laughs> uh, I might need my readers for this. Hold on. Um, oh, another one was in warrior two. Yeah. We we're in warrior two. And again, think of the theme that I, you know, it was like this lightness of the neck and shoulders and arms, you know, like that in this kind of curious, so we're in warrior two, arms were out to the side. Um, and I was, I think I had like done a little cueing on like find a comfortable neck position, you know, like, so it, it would really like find what works for you was where the cues and the computer came on and said, um, bring your arms parallel to the floor, turn your palms down and turn your head forward or something like that. And it, again, it was completely contradicting everything that I had just offered because it was a generic cue. It was, this is how you do warrior two. And so I spoke with the the guys and I was like, what if they have neck pain? What if they deliberately don't want to turn their head all the way over? This is a a neck relief class. You know, why would that cue be in here? It doesn't even belong, you know? And that's when they started to get a little stumped. They were like, oh, you know, well, then what do we say? So Jules, through this process of kind of this like back and forth with them where um, you gave them this class and then they fed it back to you to try out, did they at any point ask you, like, can you give us another class where you teach this way? Like, did they try to change your teaching to fit? No. 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 They were really- They did not do that. They did have other people's classes uploaded that weren't, you know, as so much in my style uh, and- so I did play around with one of those and it was a little bit more yeah. kind of basic poses and shapes. Um, and I actually had some of my friends, I, you know, I was able to share it like in my little network. And so some people also took it and, and gave me some feedback. Um, and so one of those examples was, um, let me see, she, she gave me some info here. Um, the computer gave, she was in downward dog and the computer gave her instructions for pigeon pose. 
So again, the computer, I think, just got confused that, but that's a glitch that will, can be resolved, right, you know, but so no big deal. But, um, and then she was corrected to straighten her elbows when her elbows were straight. So again, like, I don't know, maybe there's a carrying angle or, you know, maybe it just was spitting out a generic cue, like turn your head to the side, you know, I don't know, but, but they were straight. So that was interesting. And then she also randomly got the navel to spine cue in one of the poses, which that is really interesting because it wasn't even like a, a, a pose that wasn't like boat pose or something where you're like trying to engage the abs. It was just a random, you know, so how is the computer assessing whether your navel is in to your spine or not i mean aside from the controversy around the cube we can leave that alone that's a different <laughs> podcast but you know what i mean like what like it's just generic no and well it doesn't know that's the thing so it's like it's telling you to straighten your elbows but your elbows are straight so it's not it's just so preliminary do you know what i mean it's just so early on and so i don't think they were trying to answer your question jenny i don't think they were trying to like get me to change the way i teach they were reaching mm -hmm. out to different teachers because they they built this thing and then they wanted to see how it actually worked in the real world. And that's when the problems ensued, right? Is like, it doesn't really translate. Absolutely. I mean, it just, it almost seems just like it ends up being the opposite of the point. At least it seems like if the point is to offer a personalized yoga teacher, like AI yoga teacher experience, it seems if anything, like the AI is actually trying to just fit people into these like external aesthetic boxes, which is, kind of the opposite of personalization, at least, at least the way I would see it. 100%. And this is like literally my work. This is like, you know, Travis referenced my book. My, my yoga biomechanics book is about tissue mechanics and injury and safety because after two, three years of digging through the kinematic research and for the listeners that don't know what kinematics is, it's like properties of movement, like the video motion analysis and, you know, and, and, and you're, you're putting like reflective markers on joints. That's how they do this. And they're, they're taking a photo of you in a pose and they're measuring angles and calculating things. And after years of digging through that research, it told me nothing about teaching yoga better. You know, it told me it, 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 it told me some some interesting data points, but they didn't make me do a down dog better or do a handstand performance better or it didn't help me with any of that. And I would read all that research and get continually frustrated by the conclusions that they would make. You know, they would be like, oh, well, because of this data, then like, for example, uh, they measured EMG. So they measured muscle activity in different poses and they're like, single leg poses has greater lower leg activation than double leg poses like half moon versus warrior two okay great that makes sense you know and then they'd be like therefore half moon should be part of a gait rehabilitation program and i'm like wait <laughs> like it's never been tested in a gait rehabilitation program just because yeah. you have higher emg um and so i had to like go through all of that and go through the frustrations and let all of that go and figure out what part of biomechanics actually helped teachers, you know, become better teachers. And that was the like understanding how, you know, tissue behaved and stretch and all that stuff. And now I feel like this is going backwards. It's going right back into that area where we're looking at kinematic data and making conclusions. That makes so much sense. Thank you so much for explaining it that way. And yeah, just kind of that, that, very interesting comparison between that kinematic research versus like your, I don't know, much more, much more holistic approach that actually takes in so much more nuance when it comes to um, the body biomechanics mm -hmm. movement. Like it's really clear when you, when you compare it that way and contrast it that way, it's really clear to see. When, when you're operating on that, like, I don't know what year paradigm many moons ago paradigm where like this is the particular way that this should be done and it's these exact angles and everybody should do it this way and this is the one right way then mm -hmm. yeah uh maybe if the technology is fine-tuned it, it could uh facilitate practice like that but that's not how we're advocating for for teachers to teach and yeah. for practitioners to practice and while it like in theory i guess you know yes in theory it could do that but as soon as we we bring human variability into the equation, it changes completely. 
So what if the model, the instructor has scoliosis and one shoulder blade always sits higher than the other? Like now, now the student is being compared against that, do you know, <laughs> or vice versa. What if the, what if the teacher doesn't have scoliosis and the student does? And now they're like being cued into these odd positions that isn't really appropriate for their, their body. So, so I think like back to Travis's, like whatever era that was, you know, um, I think that the reason we've m migrated beyond that era is because we're starting to understand human variability. We're starting to understand all of these things and that we didn't understand back then. And so that's where I mean, where it's like, it's kind of going backwards. And, and I understand why, because the people developing this stuff aren't studying biology. They're not studying human movement. They're not studying exercise science. They are, they're, they're, they're in an algorithmic state of mind. Right. And, and the algorithm needs something to compare it to or, you know, it needs it needs a direction. And so that's where I come in is I'm like, I bring them the real life challenges. Like, in theory, this is great, but it's not how it yeah. works. But I guess the question is like, OK, can you start the algorithms at this um, more simplistic, over oversimplified flavor of yoga? And then can over time, could we teach it these more nuanced things about what the teacher's doing versus what the student's doing? Um, and can it account for all of that? I mean, it's, it, that would be amazing. That would also be very challenging, right? Yeah. And I, and I, I think that's why I'm so passionate about this. Like it, it, I mean, it can't be done now, but that, I mean, what, you know, iPhones didn't exist 20 years ago. Do you know what I mean? So like it, it can it be done right. very likely, you know, not by me. I'm not the developer here, but somebody can, you know, but it, so, so I don't, I'm not, I'm not against all of this work. Do like, so like I'm, I promote mm -hmm. it. Like mm -hmm. this is great. I think AI is awesome. It's just, we have to be realistic about it and, and like, and raise these challenges so that one day it can be useful at the moment. It's not quite yet. And I think the reality of it is that that the way in which we use it, we don't we we haven't figured that out yet. Do you know what I mean? Like we can't possibly envision how it's going to be used because we haven't invented it yet. Uh, so I think that's the exciting wow. part is, is this is all trial and error. And we're just trying to figure out what can and can't be done, which is why I anytime they reach out to me, I'm like, I'll, I'll be a consultant because I want to forward things along. You know, I'm not I'm not asking these questions to be like, shut it down. I'm asking these questions to be like, make it better. That's the, that's my role in it. I really love how you say that because yeah, it just shows that you didn't go into this project with the, with this preconceived idea, like this is just not going to work. And I'm going to give them the feedback that tells them that, but you, it sounds like you actually see the potential, like a potential future where, where, I mean, maybe, maybe we don't know because the technology just isn't there yet, but I mean, in my mind, it could be very cool if at some point in the future there was a techno, you know, maybe you buy this AI software as a yoga student and then you, you answer questions about yourself, about your body, your, you know, size, limb lengths, I don't know, painful issues, just things like, you know, previous injuries, maybe you could mm -hmm. input all of that somehow in, in some mm -hmm. questionnaire and then, then the software is really tuned into your body. And maybe. I mean, I, I can't imagine how how that would really look, but, but possibly like that could be great. That could really help empower maybe people who otherwise are afraid to practice yoga or just feel intimidated, you know, from home. Yeah, um, and there are a lot of barriers to entry. So, but again, yeah. like at the level that it's at, I don't see how just practicing off a DVD or off YouTube is any, any different. In fact, you know, in fact, it's probably more personalized because you yeah. get a teacher and their own personality and, you know, and it's still safe. I mean, like, it's so funny that we worry about all this safety stuff when, you know, yoga is overwhelmingly safe. It's a really low impact, you know, like low yes. velocity sport, you know, if you want to call it that. But, uh, but like, you know, we have, we put all this, like this weight on like, oh, you have to practice with a teacher yet. Like there's, YouTube channels left and right on yoga. And there's, you know, like, so it's just, we kind of contradict each other on that precaution, I guess, is, is kind of Thank you so much for, I was told, I had in my mind, I wanted to come back because earlier you mentioned that thing about safety and I wanted mm -hmm. to follow up and ask you about that. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I mean, that's definitely, I just, I kind of tend to get that feedback from just general public person. Like if someone finds out 
I teach yoga and I teach, you know, yoga online through an online class library. Uh, sometimes they'll just say like, well, I just, I want to know that I'm doing it right. You know, like I, I'd be afraid to just start yoga that way because mm -hmm. I don't want to hurt myself or, mm -hmm. you know, that's why I think I should go in, in person. And of course, in person is amazing. Like there's so mm -hmm. much that's wonderful about that, but like online can be a, t a great tool as well. And I think that question of safety is kind of a nuanced one. Mm -hmm. Um, but you spoke. I think really that's well really that. the point, though, is I understand that beginners do want to know if they're doing it right, which is, I think, mm -hmm. why this whole conversation is existing, why there's a race to become the first AI yoga program. You know, I, I completely understand that. And so I think that's like a deeper question. Like, why does it matter? <laughs> like, what is a right yoga pose? What is this is a philosophical question? What is a correct yoga right. pose? If you're not, if your foot's not turned out the right degrees, how is, does it suddenly not become triangle? And so I think that that's like, like, what are we measuring? And so that was one of the questions yeah. I asked these guys. I was like, what, like, what's your measure? Like, it, you know, it, it, what's the performance marker? You're measuring a shape. Like, like it's, that, that's not a measurement. You're literally measuring like a range of motion, I guess, is what you're measuring. So like, if somebody doesn't have the range of motion, they don't have the range of motion. Are they doing it incorrectly? If you can't, if you can't put your belly on your thighs in a forward bend, because you don't have the hamstring flexibility, is it incorrect? And so I think that's like the, 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 the issue with, with just the way the public perceives yoga is they think there's like a correctness to it. And so it's, our job mm -hmm. as yoga teachers to make that perception change and the AI is not helping, <laughs> you know, because they're just spitting back right those cues that we're trying to let go of that let people, you know, it's a forward fold. The most important part of a forward fold is that you're bending forward. I would say that's it. If you're bending backward, it's a different pose, you know, <laughs> like the, the, the details of it don't matter as much, you know? Yeah. And that's the premise of the technology. Yeah. I mean, unless you are, um, you know, a dancer where it has to look a certain way or a mm -hmm. gymnast where you're going to be scored on a certain thing. But even like I was just thinking about this, you know, in preparation for this call, I've been playing tennis lately and um, I played as a child and I played in my high school team and I didn't play for 20 years. So now I've got a coach and, you know, there's different ways of holding the racket. There's different grips and there's there's a different grip between a forehand stroke and a serve. And I just as played as a kid and never got good instruction. So I learned how to serve with my forehand grip, not a serving grip. And so my coach and I have this discussion all the time. Should I relearn how to serve with the different grip? Because that will angle the racket a different way. And he's like, no, he's like, it's a more powerful serve, but you will you have a good serve and it will get worse and worse and worse and worse before it gets better. And since you're not trying to compete on an Olympic level, you just want to play socially, you're fine. But that was me, a conversation I had with my coach. If AI was teaching me how to serve, it would criticize the angle of my racket based on my grip and it would like, it would mess me up. Do you know what I mean? So there, there is a value in, a personalized human interaction. Yeah. Um, unless you, know? you could have that back and forth and it yes. could say, oh, you're, are, what, is the grip called the Western grip? Is that like one of the- The serving one is called but, the continental. The other one is yeah. like, there's a Western, there's an Eastern, I don't know, whatever. <laughs> anyway, like if it could say, oh, you're doing this. And then you could say, well, I'm doing this because of this and mm -hmm. here are my goals. And then it could mm -hmm. say, oh, well, in light of that, you know, mm -hmm. just keep doing what Carry you're doing yeah. or, or not, um, that would yeah. be yes. very futuristic. And that, but then even then you think every person serve has the same motion when they serve. And so then that becomes a problem too. You know what I mean? Like if you're going to compare it against a model, the way that I serve is not going to be the way that Serena Williams serves for not, not, and do I need to mimic her to ha be, have a good serve is the question, because what's the measure of the serve? Did it go in? That's all that matters. You know, my follow through. Yeah, I might need to follow through, but there are little details in performance that do matter, but there's still human variation in human movement, you know? And so I'm just trying to like extrapolate this AI stuff to, to sports. But if we rein it back into yoga, what are we measuring? You know what I mean? Like we're not even measuring yeah. performance. We're just measuring no. a joint angle. You can't tell if a 
a warrior one was successful or not. I mean, it, it it's generally successful if you don't fall over, I guess. Right. But it's not like the serve went in or not. Right. Exactly. And that was those were some of my questions. Like, how are you measuring success? So that glad you brought that up because I have so many things in my head I can't remember them all. <laughs> um, but that was one of the questions. Like, how are you measuring progress? Because they use that word, right? Oh. And so, how are you measuring progress? And they said, well, each time you do the class, because it re it records your data. Okay. Each time you do the class, are you getting closer to oh, the model? Yes. So Ooh, that was how it was measuring <laughs> success. Mm -hmm. Cause that, that's, that's the only way it knows how. Yeah. It's a very algorithmic way to do it and yeah. numerically objective, yep. but is that the individual's goal? Yep. Isn't that interesting? So they were like, and then I would come back with to, you know, well, how about, and they were like, yeah, maybe not. And you know, when I, when, in one of the papers at the very end, which one was it? At the very end, they were like future uses cause they're, you know, very optimistic. And they said something like, um, yeah, here it is. This is the paper as further development. This work can be extended to areas such as gym, Zumba, aerobics, physiotherapy. Like they're just going on and on and on. And I'm like, you're going to teach Zumba this way. I have zero Zumba rhythm at all. I'm the worst at Zumba. You're going to compare me to the teacher. I'm failing. And also, do I have to look like the teacher? Isn't the point if I step, 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 have fun, listen to some music, exactly. do you know, like th that's where it's like, the, the the measurement is the is the real challenge here like what are we measuring you know absolutely with that zumba example it just to me it seems really clear that just like uh zumba into a recording without ai is probably better because yeah just like you're not being criticized you know, for having no rhythm a zero percent similarity score <laughs> completely <laughs> it's like bad dancer bad dancer no moves no <laughs> rhythm so that, that's actually an interesting point for somebody who's first learning whether it's zumo or yoga like you want to be feel successful to it to an extent mm -hmm. if your feedback mm -hmm. is poor Failure. that might not uh motivate you to continue versus if you have no feedback at all, but you feel good afterwards, uh, then mm -hmm. that's would like, be I think, to keep I going. think of the forward bend example on a beginner, like a beginner, if they do a standing forward bend and they feel a stretch in their back and their legs, and they've never been, their head is down below their heart. They're like, this is amazing. Why does it need to be nitpicky? Like, what, you know what I mean? Like, they, like they come out of that class. Like, wow, that was awesome. Who cares if it was a true hip hinge or not? Like, you know, it, I, I think it's, it, it is demoralizing almost to nitpick or over criticize, even though they want to do it right. You know, they're doing right. it right. If and they so then you could, after. you could maybe fine tune based on your desire for cueing or your, uh, your level. Oh, I want mm. minimal feedback because I know that I'm just learning. Just let me know if I'm like at risk of hurting myself, which it is also hard to say, but, but to the idea that like, oh, could we, could we tweak the model based on the type of feedback and the amount of feedback that we want? Maybe. Mm -hmm. So that brings me to the next topic, because there's another paper okay. that actually sees these problems and is trying to address this. And so they are doing, um, they're building, you know, a, a different type of algorithm, a, a more sensitive algorithm where they are uploading different versions of the pose Ooh. and m m rating them on like a high adherence, medium adherence, low adherence, you know? But, so again, that's just one, two, three. It needs to be even more complicated than that. But you can imagine that turns the, the, the coding of this into, you know, a, a, a way more complicated thing. But so some examples they gave in the paper were um, like, so they had Shalabhasana or locust pose. So the arms and the, you're in a prone back bend and the arms and the legs are lifted. And that was like the high version, you know? Then there was, they had a version where the hands were on the ground, but the legs were lifted, right? And so then that was like, oh, that still qualifies. You're still doing the pose. It's just a medium version. And then they like had someone in Chaturanga and they were like, that's low, that's wrong. You know, that's not the pose. Um, and again, that's only three. I think there's a, there, there could be room for 20 or 30, but we have to start somewhere. And so I thought that was kind of cool. They gave another locust version one where it was, um, 
it was just two different body types that both arms and legs were lifted, but one was a woman that had a lot of like thoracic extension and one was, it looks like it was a man who didn't. So it, they were both doing the pose, but the angles were different. And then like the third one that was the low adherence was like a single arm, single leg, you know? So it was like one arm, one leg lifted. And so like, that's not quite the pose. Uh, so I guess that's a, a step in the right direction, you know, going, going back to like the future of it, it needs to be more sophisticated. So that was kind of cool. I thought. Yeah. And just to clarify when you're telling us about that. Um, so that is that from a research paper and yeah, so it's, I can send you the link and you can put it in oh, the show yeah, notes. We'll put it in the show notes. Yeah. yeah um, it's just a, and I can send you a couple of these. I don't, I don't have an exhaustive list cause I don't like dig around looking for it. it just ends up in my inbox. <laughs> so I just <laughs> kind of collect what comes around, but this one's um, a computer vision based yoga pose grading approach using Whoa, contrastive right. skeleton feature representations. And so it just is kind of explaining what their process is, recognizing some challenges, and then uh, very quickly it goes into lots and lots of mathematical formulas. So <laughs> most people won't want to <laughs> read all of it, but it does have some photos, you know, it has some photos of triangle pose. And, you know, that's again, where it does get complicated. So the, the low, medium, high triangle pose, um, the low adherence triangle pose, the person has their hand on their shin. The, oh. the yeah, the medium <laughs> adherence, the person has the hand on the foot and the high adherence is like, you know, big triangle hand behind the foot, like big open. Oh so it's, it's still grading, you know, the locust ones are better because it's like, are you doing the pose or not doing the pose? But this one is like grading triangle pose on, you know, what, what we perceive as good yoga. Deep. And that's, yeah, deep, big stretches. And again, like, this is where I run into, if, if, if there, a new person doesn't have that range of motion, they just don't have that range of motion. So now you're going to grade them for being <laughs> bad at yoga when it's just like, it's not available. They can't, they can't, it's not a motor learning thing. They can't possibly put themselves in that position because they, they they don't flex that much. You know, like you can't, someone who can't bend their knee all the way, you know, post-surgery they bend the knee as much as they can. You can't just tell a computer can't say you're doing it wrong, bend your knee more. And then they just miraculously bend their knee more. Right. <laughs> you like, know, like, <laughs> like, like Jenny said, Oh, well, maybe I could let it know about my injury mm. history or what's painful to me in this moment. And I was even thinking, well, let's take it to the next extreme and let's do our assessment as a, as a precursor to taking the class. So uh, it tells you what ranges of motion that it wants to see, and you show it what your available ranges of motion are. Now, of course, it's only the sagittal plane, um, <laughs> but if if it can have those parameters ahead of time, then it can know what your individual mm -hmm. ability is before it goes and tells you what you're doing is wrong and you need to go deeper when you actually can't. And then the next challenge with that is just because I can bend my knee in a neutral position, Doesn't it's different if I can bend my knee that much when I'm in a side bend with my hip flexed and my arm behind my head. You know what I mean? Actually, so like, so do the whole so, class as <laughs> as the assessment before you can then compare yourself to your baseline. But that so that's actually an interesting idea to say like, okay, instead of comparing me to the the model, compare me to me from my first about to my second time repeating this class and but it's still like well what it's is still the, performative well, based yeah yeah it's still that uh, you're right i think i you know we're back to we're back to you know doing the the, the test is the exercise is the test is the exercise so now we're back to you do the your own class and then it compares against yourself but but we're still what is the objective measure that we're looking for here and i think that's the philosophical question that the computer cannot answer yet whereas a teacher know. can <laughs> yeah you know well, and that's where the te can, another teacher might disagree yes. <laughs> yes but but that's where like so that's where open-ended queuing comes so let me pull up some more I, again i pulled all these stuff up um because i asked the guys i was like can you maybe offer instead of giving them a generic cue like turn your head or don't bend your knee this way or don't flex your spine or whatever you know i was like is there a way you can ask an open-ended question you know can you can you have the computer say like, you know, um, you know, 
what does it feel like if you turned your leg out a little bit more or what is what would it you know uh, you know something like that where there wasn't like a yes no and so the computer could be sensitive to what's going on in the pose but let the user kind of find their own i thought i think yeah. that would be really That's helpful a great idea yeah. yeah but they were like i i don't think i um wrote all they that down like but th no it's <laughs> i don't think they didn't like it they just it the the problem with it they they were open to it the problem with it was that now it warranted the finesse of an experienced yoga teacher. <laughs> so right. then why not just go to the yoga teacher? You know, like that was, it, 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 it was like, we were going so far into the future that we're back to, well, you know, I guess the most personal approach really is to just take a class from a teacher you like, <laughs> you know, I was like, yeah. And that was where like, we just went in circles, you know, they were open to it, but they, they, they couldn't come up with those prompts because they're not yoga mm -hmm. teachers. And so, right. And, and That's my right. prompts come with the theme with the class. Do you know, it's like, it's not an open-ended prompt, right? It's like, if it's a neck relief class that I prompt around that, if it's a, if it's like a, you know, a, a class about, you know, your standing poses, then, then the prompts are around the feet. Like, and it, it just isn't that sophisticated. Um, it, it almost, so you said like it took your class, but then it was layering it on top of what it had already been trained on. Mm -hmm. It almost needs to be trained on a large data set of your teaching mm -hmm. and then it can create mm -hmm. an AI version of yeah. you yeah, um, uh, or do the same for Jenny or another teacher. Yes. Uh, but that's like not trivial. Well, and that, A, it's not trivial and B, like the user end experience, like I, I can't afford a program like that. Do you know what I mean? Like, so it's not practical because, because you'd need, you know, it need, would need to be so mass produced that it, you know, that it's like when we started this conversation, all my tools now have AI email writing prompts and whatever that's so mass produced. And I can, I can use AI for writing an email and I can teach it my tone of voice and I can do all that. Because that that's that chat GPD that that's been mass produced, but this isn't there yet. And so it's we're not, you know, maybe in 20 years or 10 years, it can do that. And it'll be, yeah, you'll just get a program that you can teach it how you teach and then send it to your students. Right. That'd be rad. It would be. It yeah. Would be. And, and then I wouldn't optimistic. have to teach classes anymore. <laughs> 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 then I would literally just teach it how I teach. It would make classes for me, and I would just sit here and write sales marketing emails. But again, so that but that brings up that problem. Like, like why why am I a yoga teacher? I actually That's want right. to teach the classes. I don't want a computer to teach for me, so I can spend more time sitting here, you know, at my computer. So um, wow. I don't know what's the goal. Yeah, exactly. Sounds like potentially self defeating. Like mm -hmm. I do, I just, I mean, I'd like to have the hope open for sure and be open minded, but I just wonder, I wonder if this could manifest into any, you know, on a practical level technology that in a yoga sense and with human variability and all of this to take into account, like, could it ever really be practical? Maybe definitely don't want to be like never. And we know there are lots of ways in which AI are, is very helpful and we all probably utilize, we all utilize it like every day. Um, one question that I had, Jules, was, is there, so clearly we're kind of, we can see so many limitations to what, the, what this um, team kind of brought to you, but do, do you see just like any bits of, um, ho not hope, but just like ways that that sort of technology could be helpful or, you know, some ways, some ways we could utilize it or learn from it as it exists. Yeah. Cause I think we kind of touched on like some future ways it could be kind of cool, you know, mm -hmm. um, as it exists. I mean, I think I, it, it is helpful to the beginner that wants to know if they're doing it right. That, I mean, mm -hmm. it is, the, it is that, do I agree personally with doing it right? No, I don't. But but that a beginner might not care what I think, <laughs> you know, a beginner might be like, I just want to know if I'm doing the pose right. I want to know where to turn my head in warrior two, period. Mm -hmm. Like, mm -hmm. I don't want to know, you know, so, so it could be useful for that. You know, I want to know mm -hmm. to put my knee over my ankle. You know, I don't want to know. I don't want to be given three options of where to place my knee. I want to put, you know, so it could be beneficial for that. Maybe you could just take out some yeah. of the fearful language. You know, maybe it just is, right. you know, like. You know, in this pose, you put your knee over your ankle, not don't put your knee forward because it'll, it'll explode. You know? <laughs> but but that's okay. That that can be easily changed, you know. So 
I think I think yeah. some people would enjoy it, to be honest. Uh, I just philosophically can't get behind it yet. Uh, but that doesn't mean like, I guess it doesn't, it doesn't matter. It's coming. Like, I guess let's be realistic. It, what do you mean? You think well, it it's coming. coming? I mean, AI is coming like there, it is, it, it is an unstoppable force. So it's, it's really like, even just look at like all the Hollywood stuff that's going on, right? All the Hollywood strikes because the writers want to make sure that they're protected. Like we're at a moment where, where, it is coming and it's really up to us to decide how we want to regulate it, how we want it to show up for us. And I think that's why I get so involved in these projects. Like, you know, I'm, I, I, it, I want to help it serve us better in the future. And by just sitting aside and complaining about it, <laughs> you know, that's, that's not going to help. So like, I'm not, I didn't tell them to stop doing it. You know, it was like, I was just like, how can we make it better? How can we make it better? Cause if you're going to have beginners using it, then let's make it as as good as we can at this stage with the information that we have and the technology that we have. So I don't really answer your question, Jenny, but <laughs> no, I think you, I think, I, I think the idea that like in a couple of years and five, however many years, like this will be here, mm -hmm. maybe a little bit evolved from what we're describing right now is like, like the inevitability is good to wrap our heads around. And then to your point, like, like you said, it doesn't matter what we think. Um, in a in a learner centered perspective, if the person if that's exactly what the person wants, then who are we to? We can disagree, but they should be allowed to do what they want to do. And in a capitalistic sense, who cares what we think, <laughs> right? What it matters is that it's something that someone wants to pay for and buy. And that's what, you know, like literally that's the, if, if there's something that they can market and sell, then that will happen. So, you know, we're just trying to, we're just trying to be a part of the trend, be a part of the conversation. I think that's the best chance we have. Because as we know, in a capitalistic sense, the easiest thing to do is say, you're broken, this is wrong, and this is why you need me. Yes. That's the easiest sell to have. Yes. And so, you know, we the, the more involved we are, the maybe the more we can tamp down that fear-based messaging and and have it be something more empowering. Yeah. I mean, I think it's it's amazing that you've been involved in the ways that you have for to be able to offer that perspective because I'm sure there are other air quote experts who they reached out to who didn't <laughs> raise any of these concerns and they were just like two thumbs up this is great i'm so glad that it let people know not to put their knees past their toes otherwise their <laughs> knees would explode that is perfect <laughs> i'm sure <laughs> so they liked me but they didn't like me you want to hear the kind of the, how it ended with them in a, in a good way you know we were, yes, we're buds yes um, please <laughs> but so they, they wrote, um, after a lot of thought and consideration, we decided to pivot away from the idea of a platform that provides feedback to a user while they learn an activity. After conversing with you and several other experts, we began realizing building the technology to give users, users a satisfactory experience compar comparable to a live instructor was not going to be possible in the near future. Oh. So they pivoted. Um, and this is just one. I mean, again, there's there's... Somebody if you dive into the research, yeah, like this, what there was, this was just like, it was, it was two guys just like, you know, making stuff. And they, they, so they were like, they basically said, with that said, our le next logical step is for us to pivot to another idea. Um, so I like, I was like, I'm sorry. I hope I didn't shatter your dreams, you know, <laughs> but, you know, but like, but so, and so I'm, other people will come up with something like, it's just wasn't, they were like, yeah, they, they got it. They understood. It's hard. Thank you for sharing that. That's really, you know, interesting to hear like from them directly, mm -hmm. how they kind of came to terms with this. And I mean, it sounds like they just had, they had this idea. I get it. Like on the, on the surface, mm -hmm. it seems like a great idea. It was so smart of them to reach out to you as an expert. Like clearly you would have so much to tell them, but I mean, that's one of the reasons that you do research on a project in the mm -hmm. beginning mm -hmm. is to find out if it's even feasible and if it makes sense. And so it sounds like they um, they were they were good about that and just realized like not 
not right now. Yeah. And I think they like they again, they're just, you know, trying to develop things. And this was they bit off more than they could chew. <laughs> you know, they're like, maybe we don't need to be the leaders in this space. We'll step aside, do something else. And right. one of these other technologies will, you know, like the one with the the measuring the medium, low, high or low, medium, high adherence, like maybe they're they're more cutting edge and they're more, you know, I don't I don't not that familiar with all of them because I haven't had the, you know, privilege of actually like conversing like we had a ton of calls and we tend to back and forth on emails so i was really a part of it but like a lot of these other ones i'm just reading about in the research and i don't i don't know the developers yeah that's um i think it's a really good reminder though that you told us earlier which was just to you know we don't want to be in denial that this technology is coming and I, I, the little bit that I tune into kind of like AI stuff on like, like to chat about it, which really is through Travis, Travis, in my opinion, knows a lot more about it. And he's actually taught me some of the AI stuff that I know, but just that it seems like there's this sentiment out there, which is just like this, this technology is already here. It's been here for a while. It's coming. And if you don't like tune in and start learning how to use it, you can easily be left behind. At least that seems to be um, a message that's out there. So I think that you know, talking about this today is helpful because it helps all of us tune into and realize like we should keep our eyes out and also not, you know, necessarily be closed minded uh, about, um, you know, things that might be coming our way. And the thing about AI is that it learns the more you use it. Right. So right. like like my kind of issue with like just the AI writing, you know, is it searches Google for all this like common generic stuff. And then it learns that more and then it spits out more common generic stuff. And so it's like this self-perpetuating circle. And those of us with novel ideas in the corner that aren't being, you know, on top Google searches, you know, are like, you know, like shouting from the rooftops going, well, I don't know. I have a differing opinion. And, and, and AI like doesn't pick that up. So it's one of those things that's like, if you want to, to be a part of the evolution of AI, you've got to get in there. You can't just stand aside and be like, no, because it'll just keep learning itself and, and moving forward. So I think like, we, mm -hmm. you know, wh while we don't like it, we don't need to reject it. Like let's, yeah. let's embrace it and make it better. I don't know. Do you agree, Travis, on the, like how it teaches itself the concept, you know? Yeah, for sure. Well, it's funny to think about because like as more people adopt it and more texts become AI generated, then the, uh, the data that gets fed into it or gets trained on is itself AI. And it's like, <sighs> yes, very, very meta. But the the other piece of it that like, I think the, uh, the yoga topic brings into really clearly is like people worry, oh, AI is going to take my job or AI mm -hmm. uh, is so good that it's better than, better than humans. Right. And, and, and this yoga example clearly shows that like, yeah, if you're a really, really um, maybe new or just uh, quickly 200 hour trained teacher, like maybe an AI <laughs> technology could be as good as you. But like if you have some experience, like you immediately see how you are as a teacher better and more sophisticated and nuanced of an instructor. And that, that, also applies with the generative text uh, mm -hmm. where, yeah, AI is really good at that right now, um, but the best writers are better mm -hmm. than AI. Always, 100%. So, so it's like I tell my students like, yeah, you could use AI to do this, but I, and that many people will, but I want you to practice your own writing so that you can be the top 10% mm -hmm. of, of writers that are even better than everybody else who's just using AI. Mm -hmm. I have a friend who's an English teacher here in Las Vegas, high school English teacher, and she'll let the students use AI, but they have to turn in the AI, pa AI paper and then their version of it because she wants them nice. to do the writing. And, you know, and, it, and it's so obvious when you read something that AI, AI has written, there's no novel ideas, you know? So, but like, I think that's great. Like it, it does, it's useful, you know, it's a useful yeah. springboard for certain things. But so like, maybe to, maybe this is an answer to Jenny's earlier question. Like, maybe that is how AI is used is like, it. it's like the AI, like for yoga, like the AI, like helps you maybe like, 
you know, write a certain basic sequence as a teacher, you know, and then you take it and you put your nuance on it and you like make that. it better, you know, or AI for a student, you know, it like the AI gives you like a framework for a class that you want to take. And then you as the student get to like, you know, play around with, you know, would you like, would you rather replace this pose with that pose based on whatever, you know? So Ooh, I think like yes. that would be a more useful thing where it's not, you're not relying on AI to do the job for you. You're you're using AI to save some time. You know, like they did, like yes. like get get the framework down, and then the nuance that is the the human you know part <laughs> is what you add. That maybe that's something. So if you could write the sequence and then ask AI for feedback on it, or even better yet, or easier, film it and then feed it into that technology where it can analyze. Oh, hey, um, these are the you know, maybe you're overdoing it on the quads in this, mm -hmm. and maybe that's purposeful, yeah. or maybe you realize, uh, like, hey, the AI offered me feedback that maybe I should replace this warrior with this um, something else. Yeah. Uh, so that that's it's great. a more balanced whatever. Uh, you make the decision if you intended it to be quad dominant or not. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. But it's like getting a second set of eyes mm -hmm. if the AI can be knowledgeable enough and trained on the poses to be able to mm -hmm. offer that. Like it's, it can certainly do that on writing right now. So I don't see mm -hmm. why it couldn't learn asana. That would be cool. That's super yeah. interesting. So that's like, um, those are ideas for utilizing AI kind of more like uh, in the skill and craft of yoga teaching mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. rather than like as a yoga student learning the practice, mm -hmm. but just ways that AI could still be and really could be like these, these types of technologies and offerings could come out where um, they could be very useful that way. That's well, like oh, as the, the student, would you want to, so, okay, one of my tools will make you a, a course to sell with AI. So if I wanted to make a course that said, you know, um, you know, the benefits of yoga and I, you know, it will use AI and write out course, like benefits of yoga, you know, all this generic content. And then, and then I, my job would be to just sell it, market it, right? So now put the student on the other end. The student buys it. Do they want their education to come from AI? Like, like they could technically Google it. It's just the AI has consolidated all of Google, you know? So, but like, is that the information they want? And so I think there is a time and a place for that. If I want to learn how to best change my cat litter, <laughs> like yes. Google's good enough for that. AI is very good for that. Or if I want to learn how to, you know, best, um, you know, keep my kitchen floors clean or something like that, <laughs> you know, but as soon as we get into biology, it, things aren't as cut and dry. And so, you know, I think like, like the, the, the use of it from the student end maybe is like, th this would, a good intro into what yoga is. That would be a great AI thing. But as soon as you want to get any, you know, nuance into it, or like even the tennis mm -hmm. example, okay, well, you need to buy some shoes and a racket, and this is what the tennis court looks like. And these are the basic rules. That's good for generated auto, auto generated content. But then to actually like learn how to hit, swing a racket, ah, you need, you need people for that. <laughs> totally. Yeah. So just where can AI, where could it potentially be helpful? Where does it inherently fall short and just kind of being mm -hmm. realistic about that? Uh, well, Jules, I personally feel like you've really given us a great and like thorough treatment of this topic today. And it's been super helpful for me to just like learn from you about it because it's, yeah, yoga and AI is really not something that I had personally like thought too much about or tuned in. Um, so I'm so thankful for you for to you for being here, and I'm feeling like maybe we've maybe we're starting to um, get to a wrapping up point. Travis, do you have any any other questions or anything you were wondering um, to uh, ask, Jules? I don't think so. I uh, I really appreciate the you've expanded my horizons on this topic. The just from the the personal experience, married with the research knowledge, and uh, I'm really happy to have had this conversation. Yeah. Thanks for giving me a platform to discuss it because this has been going on behind the scenes. I'm I'm never sharing this. So it was really fun for me to kind of you, do a recap. The, the listeners heard it here first. 
Yes, they did. They absolutely did. <laughs> and kind of ironically, like I know we were talking about machine learning and AI, but I actually also feel like Jules, you really offer just, just for me personally, hearing you talk about this also just gave really uh, good insights as far as just teaching yoga in general, like as people, like when we're, you know, even though, even though we're talking about a different medium, it's still very helpful. Just thinking about where, at, where I could help and where it could fall short really, I think kind of helps me see the val even more value or see more clearly the value in what I might offer as a yoga teacher. And I, I think our audience would maybe relate to that as well. Awesome. But uh, what I wonder is we are going to put links in our show notes, Jules, to all of your offerings, but could you share with us, like what, what, where would you direct listeners to go to find out more from you and learn? You have so much to teach. You're my main yoga mentor. I've been influenced by and learned so much from you. So I highly recommend all of your offerings to our listeners, but where would you direct um, people to go? Just to my website, which is julesmitchell.com. Mm -hmm. I mean, I have so much stuff. I can't even bother to list it. It's like, I have everything from live streams to on demand to in person. So I like, it would take me an hour to go over all the options. You know, the live streams are obviously dated, so they happen and then they're over, but the on demand anytime I have online classes. So just go dig around, check out my book, you know? Yeah, definitely you check out get on my mailing book. list. You know, we, I'll, I'll um, keep you posted. We <laughs> just moved Jules and, uh, in some, in moving, we also were like moving our books and I just, I don't have like a lot of books that I, that I read and take with me wherever I would go. But yours was like one of the few that I was like, we are, I'm, I'm keeping that like that stays Thank on my you. shelf. It's such an excellent book and your teacher training, which I took, yeah, I took your 300, 300 hour, hour. Mm -hmm. um, wonderful. So yeah. anyway, that's great. Go find Jules on her website and then on all the socials she has like, mm -hmm. you know, she's in all those places. So with all of that said, we are just so thankful to have been able to talk to you today, Jules. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Jules. Thank you.